Oh, good morning. Come on, do better than that. Good morning. It's summertime. It's beautiful out. Thank you. We talked about it before you got here, that for you to be in here this morning, we know that you are sacrificing a beautiful day and a lot of activities, but we promise you that uh, you are in the right place, and God's going to do something amazing. It's always fun to come back. I think this is my, I don't know, fourth time back being in the journey with 3D. Uh, different locations and uh, a lot of same faces a lot of new faces so we feel like this is family one of our favorite partners with what we get to do in the city everybody in Denver um, calls me Pastor B it's been sort of this funny evolution that uh, my name's Brian but if you're even like if you come up behind me and say that I, I can almost like pre-register now to not even answer to that um, because everybody calls me Pastor B um, and we joke around like whether it's the mayor the police chief um, we work and do a lot with um, uh, pro athletes and Denver Bronco players and, and get to pass a lot of those guys now and um, none of them know my name is Brian so if you're ever in the city if you're ever downtown and you're like yeah we had this guy Brian Cedarwall at our church no one would know who you're talking about but if you say Pastor B they'll be like oh that's my boy and, and we're good so we uh, uh, are blessed to be here we're really really excited uh, for two weeks from now June 16th um, for us has become one of our favorite events of the year and we love that we have 3D partner with us so um, if you don't know about the, the Dream Center, I'll give you a little snapshot on the journey um, that sort of leads into what we're going to be doing in two weeks. But my wife and I moved here from L.A., gosh, uh, 11 years ago now, and sort of thought we knew what we were doing um, as far as coming to Denver to do ministry, and God has taken us on sort of this crazy wild ride um, to get to the point that we're at now that we officially got to launch the Denver Dream Center uh, a little over four years ago. So it's about seven years, which is crazy. I tell people all the time, I'm super impatient, very antsy, can't sit still. And if you would have told me 11 years ago, like just sort of serve for seven years and, and let God sort of groom through some things and, and then four years of, of launching the Dream Center to get where you're at now, I would never have done it. Um, but now we get to look back and see through the craziness of the journey, all the relationships, how God sort of set the stage to get to where we're at now. Um, so the Dream Center, when you hear me tell stories about who we serve and, and what we get to do, it really is the result of 11 years in the making and then different team members that are here moving out in the journey and, and being a part of, um, Jen, our program director, moved out uh, to be part of the Dream Center. Um, I sold her on being a part of the Dream Center before the Dream Center existed. Um, and so she moved out. I got to be her youth pastor in California a long time ago. And, uh, and so she moved out to be part of that and told her, like, hey, just live in our basement for a couple months and then you'll get a place and it'll be great. And so she was in our basement for two years. Um, with three boys sharing a bath, you're like, great, like every, every person's dream come true. Um, but every step along the journey for us has been just sort of wild and crazy, and God's worked it out. And we tell people the Denver Dream Center, our tagline is to rescue, rebuild, and restore. And, and we like to, to play spiritual lifeguards. We, we love to get into neighborhoods. We love to get in places in the city where, unfortunately, they can't get to places like this. I wish that they had the, the bandwidth, the strength, the finances, or the resources to get to a church on Sunday because there's great churches all over the place, um, but they're drowning. They're, they're just struggling to wake up this morning um, with being a single mom or being evicted or having a, a drug addiction or coming out of prison, and they're in crisis mode. And so we feel like God has placed us in a position to play lifeguard, to jump in and try to pull people out from where they're drowning and bring stability to rescue, and then we love that God rebuilds their lives. Um, half of our team and staff, probably if you ever come, we do a Thursday night church service. And if you're ever in the city on a Thursday or want to come check it out, we would love to have you. But our Thursday services are, are interesting. Um, we tell people, we're sort of that church on a Thursday that you want to pray with your eyes open because your purse or wallet or phone may be gone. Um, you know, if, if you're like me, I'm the one rare guy that doesn't have any tattoos. Uh, but majority of our group does, or they're on paper, they're ex right? So when you walk in on a Thursday, it's this grace of God picture that it is black, brown, white, it is. We've got business owners and pro athletes, but we've got 30 to 40 inmates that we van over. We send out vans to the projects and bring in moms and kids. And so uh, our kids' ministry, Grant, who's uh, running a lot of that now, is figuring out like it's a little bit interesting. We try to hire really big guys because our kids are, are quite crazy. Uh, but all of that together, we've seen God in the last three months, or the first three months of the year, January, February, March, um, over 260 people have made a decision to accept Christ. That's a good place to go. And, and now that we're in June, I believe the number, we don't have it tallied exactly yet, but we're, we're well over 400 people that have accepted Christ now. 
Um, the first three months of the year, we were looking at our numbers, and one of our big passions is working with ex-offenders and, and men and women coming out of prison. And, and for me, it's one of those worlds, and we're going to talk about this in the message in a minute, but you, have you ever found yourself in a place or a position, a relationship, a job, somewhere that you never intended to be? Anybody ever find yourself there? Right? Probably all of us at some point, like, not quite sure how I got here. My intentions, right, was to get married or go to college or get a job and be here, and God sort of takes us this way. Um, to get to this position. And um, for me, right, I'm, a, I'm a church kid. I love coming to churches because I don't have a story of running from God or being incarcerated. I was never a drug addict. Um, I've never you know, experienced that life of having to be set free or delivered or someone like chasing me down. But for whatever reason, God's placed that call on me that, that I get to do this. And, and our team gets to do this. And um, the first guy I met when I moved here 11 years ago, um, had just gotten out of jail, got back in trouble, and landed in community corrections. At that point in my life, and it sounds funny to say, I didn't know anybody in the state of Colorado. I think everybody in the state now has my cell phone. But 11 years ago, you laugh, but there's, uh, I think, what, over three to 4,000 inmates have my cell number. Um, not quite sure how that happened. Don't recommend that. Um, but uh, at that point, I didn't know anybody. So um, I started going down to the facility to just meet up with this guy, and I would give him my ID, they would let me come in, and, and I would just can't, um, sort of catch up with him, and then I would leave. But I kept doing it once or twice a week, because I didn't know anybody else, and got to know his case manager, who happened to be a Christian. And she became the director of that facility that oversaw 120 men, and uh, at one point she asked me when I was coming down, you know, when you're here, can other guys just come and talk? I think they need someone like you to be here. And without case managers or staff workers, like, and they just come in. And so without trying, we sort of started a Bible study in this facility. And then for me, it was an eye-opening experience that I began to realize that stats, like in the United States, we have about 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. That recidivism rates are somewhere near 70 to 80%. Um, different stats, different, different numbers out there. But I know a couple years ago in Colorado, there were around 13,000 um, people that paroled in the state of Colorado, almost eight to 900 a month. Within two weeks, 60% of them will reoffend and get caught and go back to jail or prison, right? It's this cycle that repeats. And, and then we're going to realize, like, it's not that they don't want to get out or do better or be a dad or a husband or contribute to society, but when you've got a lifetime of addiction or if you've got multiple felonies, right, the odds are stacked against you. And you can do 99 things right, but as soon as you miss one moment, you, 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 you go out and drink or you have a hot UA or something happens, and they send you right back, right? There's, there's so many odds stacked against them, so they don't even try and they don't even know how to start. So we jumped into that world. And for us, that's a big passion of what we do, is trying to find ways to bring them to Christ, to see transformation. Um, in January, February, March, we averaged around 310 men a month that we're uh, working with coming out of prison that are in either our Bible studies, our men's groups, or come to our Thursday night service. And so what we're preparing for, and this is what we, number one, want to invite you to pray for us for the day. But if you can show up, I promise you, it is a transformational moment that will stick with you. Um, June 16th is Father's Day weekend, so Father's Day is on Sunday the 17th. Um, and so we'll do our event on the 16th. But it all started for us, again, even before the Dream Center existed, um, I was in one of the facilities, and these guys that I kept connecting with, and I've got three boys that are 14, 11, and 8. And for me, it became that reality of, that's, that's my world, right? If you're a parent, right, your kids might drive you crazy, but you'll do anything for your kids, right? Your family is everything. And listening to these guys incarcerated, they don't want their kids to go to jail or prison. They don't want them to fall to the same place. But they don't even know really how to even be a father to their kids. And so I asked one of the facilities, Again, this was eight years ago, if we could do um, like a Father's Day barbecue, if we could just get a couple guys out, take them to City Park, um, play cornhole and, and eat, and then take them to the zoo with their kids. And so they let me do that. And we got seven guys out in the very first year. Um, and these guys, I'm watching them literally just pace back and forth. Right? They're, they're like nervous kids on Christmas morning, wondering if their kids are going to show up or if you know, their girlfriend or their baby's mom is going to actually bring the kids over, if any family is going to show and most of them, they had a couple of people come and, and some kids. I remember this one young man, um, Javier, that had gone to prison for a vehicular manslaughter and some gang activity. Um, his daughter was two when he got locked up. Ten years had passed. He hadn't seen her, and now she's 12. And so he was just pacing nervously, waiting, and is she going to come? And she gets there, and just full of joy, right? Like just, instead of it being an awkward moment and her seeing um, her dad in a facility and, and being just another statistic or a number, she gets to see him at a park. And this family reconciliation moment was so powerful. 
and we walk away from that and, and I watch them we, we got them zoo passes and and literally like he would not let go of her hand as they walk over to the zoo and spent that moment so it started eight years ago with seven guys and about 30 kids and family members. Now it's got to the point that we're expecting this year somewhere between 100 to 150 men that will get out of corrections. Um, they'll be inviting their families. And some guys, we tell them, if you don't have a family, we still want you to come because we want these guys to be there. They can be, I mean, you can borrow my kids. Um, my wife doesn't like that, but I'm like, they're running around just, you know, you're good. Um, that's your family now. Um, but these guys will come and they'll wait and they'll just pray that their families show up, but we've got, um, the mayor now comes, and he's going to start off the day and just show that there's a partnership, and the city believes in these guys, and um, we've got the police chief coming, we've got some pro athletes coming, we've got churches like 3D, we've got a football team coming, and all these people to create this moment that we're expecting four to 500 people today um, on June 16th at Cornavaca Park, so that we can um, bring Jesus in, into the lives of these families. So if you can make it, I, I promise you, like it's, it's one of those days, like once it's set up and running, really your job is to just smile and love on people, to, to, to go sit in the grass and just have a conversation, to help them play kickball um, with their kids. And of course, a fun part of the very end is we do a water balloon fight. And I tell all these guys, it's the first time legally that you can throw water balloons at cops because we have a lot of Denver police officers there. And so it's like cops and convicts on water. It's a, it's a great moment. So pray for that day because we want God to move. It's not just a barbecue. It literally is a moment that we want to bring Jesus into the middle of every family. We want to see restoration. We want to see reconciliation. And so if you can make it, it is going to be amazing. Our team will be out in the lobby. We'll answer questions and, and sign you up. If you can stay for the whole time, great. If you need to come early and leave, we'll take whatever God allows you to be a part of. And so we love all of these moments and stories like I love being able to go places and share stories because I can tell you that God is real that God is moving that lives are being saved families are being restored and uh, we do every first and third Saturday one of our favorite events we call it adopt a block um, and so we again playing spiritual lifeguards we've tried to find the places in our city that have high crime rates sort of condensed crisis communities right and, and so a lot of those are just Denver housing projects we know that they're section 8 and low income um, probably 80% or more are single parent homes and just a lot of struggles and so we've taken our time over the years to get to know Denver housing and Denver parks and rec city officials and we didn't want to come in to be a ministry that acted like we had answers that the government and, and other organizations didn't have we wanted to just serve our way in and be a support system so they found value in who we are because I can tell you um, in my years of being a pastor I was so consumed with um, gosh, pulling off a Sunday, right? Like it's so much work to get to this point from, from preparing messages and the workers and the kids' rooms and all the things that it takes that like we get through a Sunday and way back up on a Monday and we're already preparing for the next Sunday. And, and that's great, but my heart became this. I didn't want to just create a place where I expected people to come into to where we were at, but we wanted to create a ministry where we were going to where people were at. And so we worked hard to do that and serve extensively well to always be a blessing and never a burden. And it's hard because, again, I told you my personality is I want things to happen quick. And it's hard to be patient and watch God open the right doors. But now, 11 years later, we've got this great partnership like with Denver Housing. Um, we've had to meet the legal department over the years just to cross all of the, the right things so that we can have access to their buildings and their places because we didn't want to come into communities and, and say, hey, we're going to come in and do an adopt a block or we're going to come serve, but yet we couldn't be consistent with that. And obviously we know in Colorado, like it could snow tomorrow, right? I'm always checking. I know we're in June, but you just never know. It could snow, rain, hail. There's no guarantees on weather. So we didn't want to be in communities telling kids and families, hey, we're going to come and serve, but yet we have to cancel because of weather. And so now we've got partnerships. We have indoor spaces with Denver Parks and Rec. We have indoor spaces with Denver Housing. And it's crazy, right? Because none of those organizations or entities are faith-based at all. Matter of fact, there's almost this disregard and separation because so many times we've come in as the church and we've tried to... to um, do our things so big and so well, but we've stepped on toes and we haven't done our due diligence to where now what I began to see is there's a lot of disconnect between organizations and communities and what the church should be doing and how do we bring all that together. We pray all the time, impact and influence. We want to be able to stand up here and tell you stories of people coming to Christ and families being restored and, and stories of impact because that's what God's called us to do. But the other thing that we pray and we work really hard with the Dream Center is we pray for influence. We want this city, when needs arise, whether it be a gang shooting or the, the mass incarceration issues or the, the low income or homelessness or poverty, whatever, whatever the struggles are that start taking precedence in conversations around the city, we want the church to be a part of that conversation. Amen? 
Like that, that's where God's called us to be, not to, to sit on the sidelines and just build healthy right, Sunday morning groups. I mean, this is great, and hopefully God has like called you here and saved you here, but now God's sending you out to be a difference maker. And we want to be so connected in our city that when needs arise, they're like, man, who can step up and be a difference? And, and who cares about the city that they'll call the Dream Center? Ultimately, the Dream Center, we get to be sort of the arms and feet for the local church. And so we can tell you that it's working. Again, I can tell you a million stories of of organizations that will call and, and ask the Dream Center to, to create moments of service. Um, one of the mayor's main assistants, Sean DeBerry Johnson, who's phenomenal, when she has time off, she won't take a Saturday off, she'll come to adopt a block. And we're like, why are you here? She said, because I love what you guys do. And, and, and everything I do with the city, I love it, but I know if I'm going to go somewhere and serve, I'm, I'm coming here. Um, we had a phone call last November um, from the, um, the city attorney's office. Right? And, and this is a funny group because most of them are not believers, um, and they function in the capacity to like govern sort of everything that's going on in our city. And they called us because they wanted to create an opportunity for the city attorney's office to serve. So we went over in December. We took 700 Christmas presents, 125 um, lawyers and paralegals came down, and they wrapped all of the Christmas presents for us to go out and serve in the city. The mayor came. He and I had a little wrap off, and he destroyed me because I cannot wrap presents to save my life. But we're, and, right, and we're laughing because there was literally there was these attorneys that are so by the book that some of them, like we asked like a couple things, like just write down if it's a, you know, what the gift is, age appropriateness, and if it's a boy or a girl. And, and because of where they're coming from and everything's got to be right, um, um, uh, acceptable, they're like, we can't write if it's boy or girl. We have to be gender neutral. Like, come on. Like, give me that present. I'm writing it for you. Um, but if that's right. But we're not going to tell them, no, you can't serve with us because we know that's how God's moving. And so all across the board, Adopt the Blocks, God is doing incredible things. I'm telling you, the, the, the Thrive programs, our reentry piece, we're seeing God move. And Adopt the Block, um, quick story, then I'm going to get into the Bible, I promise. Um, yesterday, right, we were doing Adopt the Block, and I told the team before we started that sometimes we get caught up thinking like big and, and what's success. And we sometimes think it's an event. And what we tell people, Adopt the Block is about relationships. Even if it's that one person that shows up that needs to know that there's somebody that cares, then for us, it's worth the work to get to that point. And we're setting up, we had a couple of sites going on yesterday uh, across the city. We had teams going out and volunteer spread. And one of our sites, it's near um, uh, Bronco Stadium off of Federal and Colfax, West Ridge Housing Projects. is really where our adoptive block started. 200-unit um, um, housing complex, 180 of those 200 units are single-parent homes in, in this high-crisis community. So we're in there, we're setting up. And we get to the point that we go over um, to Paco Sanchez Park, and we're, we're getting everything set up, and there was a van that was parked there. And as I'm walking by the van, um, the, the window rolls down, and there was a, a black lady in there that called me over, and she's like, hey, are, are we okay? Are we in your way? I'm like, oh, you're absolutely fine. Um, but as I walk over to talk to her for a minute, I look in, I can see um, her husband in the um, front seat, and they had two kids in the back seat, a 12-year-old and an 8-year-old. Um, but the kids were filthy, um, didn't have shoes on, and, and so I started telling them, like, you know, what we are and, and what we're doing. My man ever calls me Pastor B, and um, she's like, wait a minute, you're a pastor? Because I'm, like, not dressed like most pastors. Um, and, but our, our group is setting up, and um, I tell the kids, like, hey, why don't you guys come out? Let's play some kickball. And, like, we don't have any shoes um, and our clothes. Like, we, I mean, their, their shirts were filthy. And, like, you know what, we're setting up. And here's what we love because it's our partnership again with churches like 3D, that you may not be able to get there, but what you give, either financially or what you give, resources, uh, I'm telling you, how many need to clean out your closet again, right? Some of us get to our closet and we're like, man, I have so many things that I do not wear, but we don't give it away because, you know, let's be honest, we know what we spent on it, and so we still had that like good intention of like, I know what I spent, so someday I'm gonna wear that even though it's out of style now, right? But we know that we could probably go through our closet and there's excess, whether it's shoes or, or clothes or whatever. And so those are things that we collect and, and toothpaste and toiletries and just basic essentials. And, and so here's the power of the moment. Um, we were setting up, and before all of the families were coming to get, get their stuff in that community, we get them out of the van, we're like, you know, we're just setting up, you guys get first dibs, just go. And these two kids hop out of the van like it was Christmas morning, right? Somebody else has donated items, but they run over there, and they're looking through everything they can find, and our volunteers are helping them, and, and Ben, the uh, older boy who's 12, he's a big kid, um, he found a pair of jeans, he found a pair of Nike shoes that someone had donated, and he thought it was Christmas morning. Um, actually, I have a picture, um, I think we have maybe there it is so there he is right he put on a pair of jeans he's tying shoes and you can show the next picture um and you can see just this smile well it's sort of dark um but there he is right he he was he was so bashful and embarrassed to get out of the van and my favorite moment of the day though is our volunteers are helping to wrap around this family 
Um, the dad gets out of the van. We had a game of kickball going on. And, and being a dad, right, like there's nothing more exciting than having my kids like smile and want to be with me. Um, and, I, and I'm talking to the dad. His, the dad's name is Ben as well. I'm like, I can only imagine what it was like for you guys to be in the parking lot this morning, just be sitting here and, and nowhere to go, homeless, living in their van. Um, what are they even talking about, right? Like for them, it's like existing, right? Some of us, our biggest issue is how many are just too busy, right? Like we can't do everything on our calendar one day because we have so many errands to run, so many things to do, so many games to get to, and all this stuff. Here they literally just sitting in the van with nowhere to go, two kids sitting in the back, no food, and trying to figure out what to do. And, and, and as God would have it, right, they park in the parking lot of where we do our adopt the block. And our volunteers just poured into them. They got clothes, they got food, they got hygiene stuff. The dad got out of the van, and I look over a few minutes later, he's out playing kickball with his kids. Um, and just this moment of he comes over, and he's like trying to choke back the tears, but he got to be a dad. He got to have this moment with his kids, and then his oldest kid was on the phone a bit later, and I don't know who he was talking to, but he's like, hey, we found our church. Um, man, these guys showed up, and he's like telling somebody about what God just did in that moment. And so sometimes we get to a place that we never intended to be, and that's what I'm going to jump into for a minute, Acts chapter 27. Um, and I'm going to go really fast because I want to get into uh, some big ideas for you this morning. But this has become sort of a foundational piece for me and, and really for our team. Our team's getting to the point that they're going to be able to preach this themselves. But I love the story of Acts chapter 27. And let me jump in here fast. Verse number 13. It says, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So here's, here's where I want to sort of set the stage. Right? The, the Apostle Paul who had this radical transformation on the road to Damascus, gets called into ministry, and instead of that calling making things easier, it actually got harder for Paul, right? You look through his life, and he's been beaten, he's been uh, arrested, he's been um, stoned, and, and not like Colorado style, right? He's been through all of these things in his life that have been a mess. Um, and, and now here he is, like he's got this big aspiration, as I said a few minutes ago, that sometimes in life we want to get to a certain destination. We want our business or our marriage, we want our kids, we want things to look like a certain way, and we have this plan and vision in our mind. But we start over here, and I wish I could tell you that it's like a straight line and an easy path, but more times than not, right, that vision that God's given you, you'll ultimately get there, but God may take you a whole different direction to finally land there. So here's Paul, like part of his dream was to get to Rome. Right, the, the greatest um, influence uh, city of the day to get to Rome to preach, to have a time with the, the, the Christians there. And so he's on a boat on his way to Rome. Now, when you look at the story, he's not on like a luxury liner. He doesn't have like a great room and it's not this comfortable ship. He's on a prison ship with 276 inmates on his way to Rome. And so it says that when a gentle wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. And for some of us, right, we can think about different phases and stages in our life and how we've jumped into various opportunities, right? It was that relationship, right? I moved there because there was that. And sometimes that's not a bad thing to, to jump in and take advantage of an opportunity. But here's what sometimes happens. So they wait anchor, they begin to sail. But before very long, does that ring a bell to anybody? Before very long, right? I don't know. Maybe... Maybe you, you thought that he was Prince Charming and, and she was, um, you know, I don't even know who to say. Um, she was amazing, right? Like, this is going to be the best marriage ever. Uh, or maybe, you, like, before, anybody remember before you had kids? Come on, how many, how many have kids? Remember before you had kids, everything you thought about parenting, right? Yeah, throw that out the window, right? Every one of us before kids, we are good parents of other people's kids. Well, if that's my kid, here's what I would do, right? And then you have your own kids, and now you're apologizing, like, I'm just sorry. Like, if you ever fly with kids, like, I was that guy before kids, then I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't let me sit by that, that person with kids. But then once I started flying with my kids, I just apologized to people before, like, I'm just sorry. Like, just brace yourself. If you're anywhere within rows of where we're sitting, um, you're just going to know, right? It's just, there's moments that we can't understand fully, but before very long. It says the wind begins to blow, and now it's a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster. It swept down from the island, and now the ship was caught by the storm, and it couldn't head into the wind. So it says what? That we gave way, and what happened? They were what? Driven along. And here's what I can tell you, what we've seen and what we begin to learn is what we get to do. And maybe your story is similar, maybe this is for you to share with somebody else, but so often in life we make a decision because we think there's an opportunity. But within that opportunity, right, what started as a gentle wind now becomes this hurricane force. 
And now, like, I don't know why my spending got so bad. I don't know why and when the drinking started to happen. I don't know when the anger kicked in. I don't know, right? And before long, it's so intense that they just they give way and they're driven along. And some of us, if we're not careful, we get into positions in life that we used to have this dream and vision of where God was going to take us and, and what our ministry was going to look like or what our family was going to look like or what my health was going to look like. But the more I try, the more it just it gets harder. And then finally, we just feel like we're driven along. And the influence of the world around us or the culture, if we're not careful, we start to compare to other people. But then he says this, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Right now you think about the point of, of, of desperation. Right? They're on this ship. They thought they had an opportunity. They begin to sail. Now the wind is so strong that they just have to like lower their sails and let the wind take them wherever it's going to. And the storm is now in control. Now they're so desperate that now they just want to survive and make it through. They begin to throw the cargo overboard. And then it says uh, in verse 19, on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging. And here's what God really spoke to us through the Dream Center. We finally gave up what? All hope of even being saved. And we see it time and time again. Again, it's this family in a van. Like I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a dad right and, and, and to really like his intentions as i talked to him later he's like man pastor B, i'm a hard worker like i want to get a job and we just we needed a fresh start and a new opportunity and there was the word right so they drove out to colorado thinking like if they could just get out to denver bigger city more things to do a better place to raise my kids but it didn't happen like they thought and now they're sitting in a van in a parking lot and i mean literally with nowhere to go no food to eat the kids don't even have shoes on their feet and they're just being driven along. And we meet people time and time again. It's the, it's the guy getting out of prison that's been told so many times that you're just a number. You're not a name. There's no value. And you, you're a habitual. Like one of, the, one of the charges that guys can get now is habitual offenders. Meaning you've been offending for so long that really there's no hope for you. And so we're going to give you a lengthy sentence because the best place is just to lock you up and throw away the key. Right? It's a single mom that we connect with that has five kids or eight kids, or we've got moms that have 10 kids with multiple dads that are now not in the picture. One of our moms that we've been working with for so long, when we first met her, was on a Christmas morning handing out presents in the projects. And um, we met her and she had, at that point, eight kids. Now she has nine, but um, the, the cycle is just keeps repeating. Her oldest daughter, 21, has two kids. One of them, um, through a tragedy, um, was like six months old, just passed away about a month ago. And just all these things that begin to happen and a son that got his girlfriend pregnant now another daughter at 17 is pregnant we like we see these things and we're like why does this keep happening because when there's no hope when you give up hope right now you're no longer fighting for for god's calling or for god's vision or for god's miracles in your life but you give up and you begin to let the storm and the wind just push you along right when they gave up all hope of being saved they're at this point of desperation but here's what i love about paul in verse 21 after they'd gone a long time without food Paul stands up and says, and this is my, my, my wife's favorite verses, men, you should have taken my advice. So for all the wives and moms, you may want to like put that on your refrigerator. Men, you should have taken my advice, he says, and then you would have not damaged yourselves and seen loss. Like, I love that Paul just has this like little moment, right, where he's like, you know what, I told you so. Because he had warned them earlier, like, hey, we probably shouldn't go right now because God told me, the Bible said they listened to the pilot of the ship rather than to, to, to Paul, who's a prisoner. I'm like, I would probably have listened to the pilot as well than a prisoner. But Paul says, hey, I told you so, but here's what he says in verse 23, or, uh, verse 22. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. He's like, here's how I know. Last night, the God, and this is such a great tagline, the God whom I belong to, and the God to whom I serve, right? You can have this confidence no matter what the storm looks like, no matter what season you're going through. Because again, you may have this vision of here's where I'm going, and you may be all the way out a different direction, heading who knows where. But Paul says, here's, here's why I know. The God that I belong to, and it's the God that I serve. See, when you've got this relationship with God, man, the world, the stock market, the, the, the housing market, the, everything can be falling apart around you. But when you can... Stand your ground and say, the, the God to whom I belong and the God to whom I serve, here's what I know. He said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. 
Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. I sort of love, like, it'd be great if, like, you could come to church and someone would just pray for you, be like, hey, what, you know what? It's all going to be okay. And, and that was the end of it. Because here's what Paul says. God told me, like, I'm not going to die on the boat because I got to get to Rome. And, and so my destination is not going to end here. It's going to get to here. But nonetheless, the boat is still going to run aground, and um, we're going to have to swim to shore. But here's what I also love. If we had more time, I was talking to, actually, Sharon yesterday, one of our, one of our leaders, and we're talking about this, this passage because it had hit him how amazing it is that Paul gets this promise that everybody with him is not going to perish. And, and some of you, you get to sort of be, right, Paul, in that moment, like, you get to be that, that stable piece and, and be the person, like, that, that people want to come to and they need prayer, that people need to come to and they need hope, and they need someone to be strong, and you can be like, you know what, just hang with me, and you're pulling people along because you know you're going to make it, and you're going to drag as many people with you to make it as well. And some of you, you need to get with that person, right? You're struggling. You wonder like, man, why does it always seem like it's not going to work? And why am I going to fail my marriage? And all these millions of things that we're struggling with, then you, that's why life groups are so important. That's why Sunday morning church is so important. Like you've got to get to a place where you can get with people that ultimately you know you're going to make it to the end. But here's what I love in the story. Well, I won't take time for this, but the next few verses is great because Paul says, all of this is about to happen. Right? They're in the middle of the storm. Paul says, hey, we're not going to die. And then if you look at verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them to eat. If we had more time, we would just talk about how amazing it is sometimes just to eat. Right? Those cinnamon rolls out there were amazing. Right? We love to eat. I love that Paul has this moment. He's like, guys, I know like, there's a crazy storm right now. We're about to like, blow this ship apart, and we're about to get stranded on an island. But hey, you know what? Let's just have some food. But in verse 28, it says, Once safely on shore, the ship breaks apart, they found out the island was called Malta. The islander showed them unusual kindness, and they built a fire, welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. And Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven up by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. Remember, remember that story? Like, you think about everything, it's almost comical at this point, right? Paul, everything he's been through from being arrested and shipwrecked and all these things happen, and they, they swim to shore, right? They're covered in seaweed and salt water, and they get there. Now, Paul just wanted to be a servant and help, and he's, he's building a fire, right? And just as he's helping, he reaches down, and a viper psh, latches on. You ever have one of those days where you're like, seriously, God? Come on, how many have prayed that prayer before? Like, seriously, God? Like, my car won't start. I can't find my keys. This happened, right? There's so many things. Like, it's already been crazy enough. I'm trying to keep my sanity. And then that happens, and you're like, seriously, God? And that's a Paul moment, but here's what Paul does, what's so powerful, right? And the title of the message today is simply just call it, your, your moment ultimately becomes your mission. And you think about everything that Paul's gone through, like he's trying to get to Rome, but one of those moments is he's arrested. And while he's arrested, he's put on a ship with all these inmates. Now, Paul could have got on the ship and be like, seriously, God? Like, I did want to get to Rome, but now I'm with all these inmates on, on a prison ship? And he could have like been frustrated, dejected. He could have sat on the sideline on that one. But instead, he listened to God. He was able to speak confidence into every one of those prisoners, bring life to them, and the moment became his mission. And then the ship falls apart. They get to the island, right? They swim ashore. They're all saved, and there he's building a fire. The snake latches on his hand. He's got another moment right here that can define him. And, and either he gets mad and frustrated where like he throws up his hands and like, that's enough, <laughs> right? God, I can't take anymore. It always happens to me, right? And he could have walked away because it says when that happens, in verse 4, the islanders saw the snake on his hand. They said to each other, right? Isn't that what people do sometimes? Right, something happens in your life or whatever, and people are really good at sometimes talking about you and, and maybe even for you and behind you. And so here all these people are watching. They see him right, covered in seaweed and salt water. They already know he's an inmate, and he's trying to tell me, hey, but I'm actually the pastor, and, and I'm with these guys, but I'm not with these guys. And let me, help, hey, let me build the fire for you guys. <laughs> Viper. And they're like, ha, ah, yeah, this dude must have some issues, right? And they're waiting to see what happens. And again, what does Paul do? Paul shook the snake off into the fire, it had no ill effects. Like, how amazing is that, right? Now, now the next moment that, that, that God gives him, whether or not he intended to, to ever get there, but the viper on his hand, he shakes it off into the fire, and now he's all good. And so now they watch him, though. They're like, what's going to happen? Is it going to swell up? Is he going to die? Poisonous viper. When nothing happens, the people expect him to swell up in verse 6 of Acts chapter 28. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing, now they changed their minds, and they said it was a God. Not that we want to walk around and have people think like that, but what, what people will see is when you go through a hardship, right? When you go through something that was unexpected or unplanned, the, the, the illness, the loss of somebody close, the job, the struggle, the whatever it is, 
and people look and they wonder like that's the test and the reality of our faith it's pretty easy to worship god and to praise god when things are going great but in the midst of some of the hardest times we walk through right that's the hardest times to to celebrate god's goodness when we don't see it or feel it to understand it um, fully what he's doing worship team you guys can come on back up but here paul is and, and they're watching and nothing happens now they think he's a god and again your moment will become your mission and here's in in chapter 28 verse 7 says there was an estate nearby that belonged to a guy named publius and publius is the chief official of the island and and i love this moment because for me it's again we talk about impact and influence impact and influence we want to have impact and we want to see god do great things but we want the stories of god's greatness to get out we want people to recognize not the dream center not a pastor b we want people to recognize life change and the testimony of transformation because that's what we're all about is bringing glory to jesus and in this moment publius he was this chief official of the island Right? And if you look at, uh, and probably we never get there, but if you have maps in the back of your Bible, everybody ever get to the back of your Bible? Maybe when you're bored during one of Pastor Keith's sermons, that would never happen. But you're back there, right? And you're looking like in the map. Like if you ever look back there, if you look where, where Paul started in Crete and he's trying to get to, to Rome, right? It's this, this line here. And when the storm comes, they, they're here, and all of a sudden they whoop, they end up down here. And, and they find this little dot of an island called Malta. Right, it's a place that Paul never intended to be. It was never on his destination or, or his journey to like, hey, guys, I'm going to go preach in Malta. Or I'm going to do ministry in Malta. But sometimes your moments become your mission. And, and maybe you don't know why you're, you're at 3D Church. Or maybe you don't know why you've got the job you've got right now. Or maybe you don't know why certain things are happening. But here's what I love about Paul. And we'll wrap up this thought. The chief official comes and says, you know, come to my house. And they showed hospitality. In verse 8, his father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. So Paul went to see him, and after prayer, check this out, Paul placed his hands on him and healed him. And when this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. So here's Paul, right? He never intended to be there, right? This, this moment on the boat, he could have just folded his arms and said, screw this. Like, God, why? Like, I give my life to you, and now this is how, like, where I'm, I'm supposed to be. But he used that moment to speak life into all those inmates and prisoners that get to the island. Right? The, the, the fire happens, and he's just trying to help. The snake bites down, and Paul has another moment. What does he do? He shakes it off. Because right? sometimes you can't plan for life's events and things that happen, but when they happen, how you respond and react speaks to everything. And Paul shakes it off, and he says this moment, like, that's, uh, that's not how I'm going to end because God's got a different destination in my journey. And then all these people come on, they see what's happening, and they bring Paul in because he didn't die. They want to know why. Bring him to the chief official's house, and find the chief official, like Paul, over, like, dude, what's wrong with your dad? Like, oh, I got the Malta fever. So Paul walks over, right, and check this out, the same hand that was latched to a serpent that could have caused him harm is now the same hand that the Bible says he lays on to publish his dad. And what was meant for harm is now used for healing. And, and, and I love this part of the story because for me, here's what it is. Some of you, you've been through really hard situations. Right? Something that you never planned for. Maybe it was an opportunity and, and, and you launched out in life and all of a sudden there were storms that came along. And if we're not careful, we get so beaten and driven along that we can easily throw up our hands and whatever happens just happens, screw it. I hate God, I hate this, whatever. And we give up. But when you give up hope, it's a dangerous place to be. Proverbs 13, 12 is like our, our theme verse for the Dream Center. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled becomes a tree of life. Don't ever give up hope. Don't stop believing in your marriage, in your kids, in your family, in your finances, in your health, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the doctor has said. It doesn't matter what someone else has said. People will talk, right? They see Paul and begin to talk. But Paul shakes it off, and he stays focused. And I love it because a place that he had never intended to be. And for me, sometimes I think, like, God, how did I ever end up doing what I'm doing with the Dream Center? Right? Like, I, I'm talking to inmates and in facilities and, and to drug addicts and drug dealers and and, and like, God, that's not my story. I'm a church kid. I gave my life to Jesus when I was four and been in church ever since. And by the time I was 12, I told people I wanted to be a pastor. And I, and I chased that. Like, that's, that's not my story. And this crazy journey to get to the point where ultimately the end of that, I love it because, what does he say? When Paul laid his hands and this man was healed, now everybody that had an issue, like, I gotta get to, I gotta get to what's going on over there. And what started as a dinner party became a revival. Publius probably had to turn his house into a church. And everybody was healed. And, and, and here's, here's the deal. You might feel like you're stuck. You're, you're in a situation, you might feel like you're stuck. 
But I believe that if you look at it and flip that, that God's got you not stuck, but he's got you stationed. And, and, and Paul could have got to the island, just moped around, like this sucks, boat's broken apart, and like I don't know where we're at, I've like, never heard of Malta, they don't even speak, like whatever that moment, but instead that moment became his mission. He didn't mope around, but he, he got busy about ministry. And he found every opportunity. And see, when you go back to the very beginning of that story, the wind began to control the boat. And, and sometimes we get in positions where like, God, this, like, right, there, there are certain things that are going to push us and move us like crazy. The wind may have controlled the boat, but God ultimately controlled the wind. And God knew exactly where Paul needed to be for the ministry that he had called him to, to get him ultimately to the final destination. Do this with me real quick. If you just close your eyes for a second. And I, I don't know what you came into today, um, what life's been like for you and, and where you're at personally, but, but maybe it is your, your marriage and it's just, it's just tough right now. Maybe it's being a parent and raising your kids. Maybe it's you feel like God's given you a calling, but what you've chased has just taken you a whole different direction. And, and, and I don't know, there's so many layers and levels in this story that, that maybe you're just in that first phase and you're chasing an opportunity and you need God to be your strength. But maybe you've chased opportunities and you're at the point of sort of throwing up your hands and like, God, I started throwing the cargo overboard because I don't know how I'm going to survive. And ultimately, they, they start throwing the tackle overboard, which was their means of just providing. And they were driven along and they gave up all hopes of being saved. But in every moment, your moment can become your mission. And God's got a ministry. There's someone that just needs to know what you're going through. And you can pull them along. And you can look at them like Paul looked at every prisoner on that ship and say, listen, you're not going down because I'm going to make it and you're going to make it. Maybe today you just need to be reminded that God's got hope for you in whatever situation you're in. And you're not stuck, but you're stationed. And what was meant for harm, God's going to now use for healing. So with our eyes closed, just in the intimacy of this moment, I'm going to pray for you and I'll get out of your way. But if you're here, you say, Pastor B, that, that's where I've been. And I just need God to remind me that he is my hope, he's my strength, that I'm not stuck, but I'm stationed. And I want God to use me in this moment that I'm going through for his ministry and his mission. That's you just raise a hand, let me pray for you. Just a lot of us, right? I mean, again, there's so many things in life. So Father, we thank you for every person here. We thank you for your grace as you speak life into us into our relationships, into our, our businesses, God, as parents, grandparents, whatever the moment may be, God, that you would remind us today across this room that we're not stuck, but God, you've got us stationed. And there's somebody that we're going to share with today, maybe over lunch, that we'll see tomorrow at work or back at school, whatever it is. God, that there's a moment now that's becoming our ministry. And Father, that you would use us along the path like we see in the life of Paul. God, restore hope, restore peace and strength, we pray. In Jesus' name.